I enjoyed it both times for what it's worth. <laughs> Absolutely. Better um, that time. I, I have the 101. Let's get this draft going, Mike. We're full already. Okay, let's get going now. Let me let oh, me we just were full before on. you went on assignment. Okay, I gotta share my screen. I'm behind you guys. I'm sorry that Big started the show. <laughs> Maybe if we had a producer. Yeah, man. Come on. What's that about? All right. All right, Zach. Tell us about yourself, my friend. Hey, I'm I'm Zach. Go find me on on the Twitter at Schultzy. My tag's right there. Um, diehard Jags fan, um, and I love fantasy. And I'm I'm excited to be uh, you know joining with you guys. Other than that, I don't think I got much more. So, Zach, oh, did we talk your, about what's, what's your username on uh, on Underdog? Or excuse me, on um, on Sleeper. Who are you? Oh, I'm Schultzy there in the 12 spot. Oh, okay, fantastic. So Joe, Fire I assume Michael. the guys went through went through your, your spiel. Did you tell everybody where they can find you and all your stuff? Sure, no. they can find me at Dynasty underscore Joe FF on Twitter. All my work over at the Undroppables. Uh, and right now, you know, it's just rookie draft season, so I'm focused primarily on that. I'm tweeting about it. Uh, I've got a thread that I'm putting out that where I'm kind of walking folks through my thought process, and so hopefully that'll be helpful. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like we, we've got a lot going on here at the Undroppables, as you know. Uh, we have the UN score that just got dropped last week, and it's got such a comprehensive rookie guide on all the rookie wide receivers. It goes back all the way to 2018. It's got such a component to fantasy football that everybody needs to get. And if you don't have part of it, you should definitely get in on it. Um, now it's my pick. I'm at the three spot. And uh, there's a Jaden Daniels still on the board. And I just been going to go with my guy, um, Malik Neighbors. And I'm picking a wide receiver in this spot uh, because I just like the, uh, the upside there. I just think the longevity could be there. There's some question marks regarding Jaden Daniels and, you know, his size and his, and his, lack of sliding so i'm gonna go ahead and play the safer spot there um what would you do in that situation there there joe in the three spot are you uh, are you a guy that's going to take a quarterback or is it just, just, just depending on what your uh, roster build is uh it depends but you know i have positioned myself in as many places as possible to come away with at least one of these top three wide receivers and so i've gotten three neighbor shares out of my six rookie drafts thus far so i'm really into him i've got two odunzes and i've got one marv uh i'm trying to get them they feel like safer bets that to me than the quarterbacks not named caleb so I'm going that direction as often as possible uh, unless, you know, I have a dire need at quarterback. But even then, I would probably try and trade back and acquire a quarterback, an established one, and maybe try and grab some picks because I'm really risk averse in super flex drafts. I want to make sure I've got a quarterback I can rely on weekly. So, you know, in most positions, I go for upside. But when we're talking about quarterback, I just I want to make sure the floor is there. Agreed. And, and, and that's the, that's the big decision marker right now when you're in a position there, especially in the top five or six picks, if you're not, you know, desperate for a quarterback, that's, that's there, there's a lot of value in those picks to be trading out of, especially if you're okay with taking one of the three guys, uh, you could move back and, and potentially hit a gold mine, uh, with, with with moving back there so I, I i like where your head is at there joe and uh, i'm in the same boat i'm more of a wide receiver guy uh as someone that's going to take the 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 standard the floor there and uh, and the longevity especially with how elite these three wide receivers are um and uh yeah so hey, going yo yeah Mike, until, until we get schultzy completely on board go ahead and turn off and go ahead and mute that sleeper draft Oh, good idea. So real quick, I chose the 109 because I figured it'd be the most interesting slot in the draft, yeah. assuming we'd go chalk. But of course, Lad McConkey went at 108, uh, taking away my difficult decision to make it 109. So I went ahead and took mm -hmm. Bowers, but um, usually 
I've seen Bowers going in that uh, top eight, and then the 109 is really a critical point where you got to decide what you're going to do next. Uh, and so we got a record- we got a mover. Sorry, I gotta I gotta jump in here because we had Schultzy talk to take a, a Trey Benson at the 112, and that's the earliest I've ever seen him go in a rookie draft so far. Do you want to just elaborate a little bit on that, Schultzy, and why you think uh, Trey Benson is going to be such an asset in the and and why you would invest a, a a first round pick on him? So I kind of adopted the strategy here. I picked the 12, and if I'm the 12, I I just won the title. So. You know, I'm kind of adopting the the strategy that like my team's ready to go. Like we're here to run it back. Um, the plan was Jonathan Brooks. Um, I wasn't expecting to get sniped there. Sniped. So I, I, yeah, so I went for Benson. Um, I think there's two backs in this class who have the clearest path to legit workhorse um, work. And I mean, volume's king for running back. And then Benson's got the traits and the athleticism to match. Um, yeah, I think it's a pretty home run spot for him. I know James Connor's going to do James Connor things again this year, even though people like probably think hurt. he won't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he'll probably get hurt too. And so, yeah, I, th- I, I really like Trey Benson, but like I said, I would have, I was planning on Brooks, but I still like Benson more than the, the crop of receivers here. Interesting. Can't argue with that logic. I like that. No, the the logic is sound. I don't know if I agree with it, but I it's it it makes sense. Um, I I Lad McConkey has not would not last past the eight if I'm picking that high. Um, I've been taking him everywhere that I can. I I love him. I love me some him. Um, but yeah, I I love I love the logic on Trey Benson. I just uh, it's. I'm not 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 really in the uh, the mood to to prognosticate on James Conner getting hurt, even though it's it's probably likely. Mm-hmm. Um, if I was in the twelve, I would have gone with Blake Corum, even though he's also behind. The, like that's the thing about this draft is that not there weren't a lot of guy. It was a very deep draft of guys who can earn jobs later. So essentially, what you're doing is you're you're this draft is just four rounds of team building for the future. There's not really a lot of help for right now. If you're, um, if you've got some of those later picks. So, uh, with that said, preferred player, I like Corum, you like Benson. I mean, that's, that's the way to go. There's absolutely nothing wrong with, with that, that pick. And I wasn't trying to say that. Right, well, guys, for me well, in that spot there for, for sorry, yeah. was that you, Joe, that was going in there or Zach? Oh yeah, I'm uh, I'm on the clock right now, but go yeah. ahead. No, tell us about your pick here because I'm interested oh. to see where you're at here. Well, I mean, to me, this is the dream scenario. Another reason I picked this draft slot is because it sets me up perfectly to get my guy mm. Roman Wilson, yeah, uh, who I've been uh, ranting and raving about to anybody who will listen. He's super underrated. Mm-hmm. I love his landing spot. I think he's gonna. Um, see the field right away as a slot player who can play a little bit inside. He's a great deep ball receiver, which is what Russell Wilson likes to do. Uh, so thrilled to get Rowan Wilson on the second half of the second round in just about any draft, particularly if I need a wide receiver. He also happened to be the top player on my board right there. Yeah, I, I love that. Uh, I love Roman Wilson. I love his landing spot. I think a lot of people had, you know, compared him to Lad McConkey because they size up very similarly. They have a very similar profile. If you look back at college, they 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 did match up very similarly. And I just really like that landing spot quite a bit. Uh, you know, he's going to go in there and he's probably going to take a, a good chunk of those Deontay Johnson targets. And uh, with a quarterback up, upgrade in, in, in Pittsburgh, he's a guy that he could potentially be a top five rookie wide receiver this year, just based off of that landing spot. And some of these other landing spots that aren't super great, like Roma Dunze uh, and Malik neighbors could also not be a super big contributor this year. If, if, you know, Daniel Jones doesn't, you know, pull up his socks or whatnot. So a lot could happen there. And uh, I definitely, uh, I, I, I like that call there on, on Roman Wilson. I, I just wanted to jump, jump back real quick and address Schultze, um, you you snipe me for Ben Sinat, um, so thank you for that. Appreciate you. No problem. Uh, so I just wanted to address real quick. You you said that you didn't like any of the wide receivers 
that went in the second round. I really think that this third round is where the, the wide receiver class kind of like opens up like a blooming rose. J- Javon Baker, Malachi Corley, Jalen McMillan, and Jamar Burton. That is like the hardest choice for me to make be- between those four. Um, but you're going to miss out on all of them. So what are you going to do at wide receiver? You, you, I mean, you, you went running back, then you went tight end. Um, are you imagining that you don't need wide receiver? That and and let me just say that's a little bit different than we've we've all these mock drafts that we've done so far. Uh, similar guests we've talked about. We don't know what our teams look like, so we're just drafting BPA. You have a little bit different tack, so that's that's why I was asking. But what are you going to do for wide receiver in this draft with so many such a huge class? Well, yeah, Not since totally. I like I said, if I'm drafting twelve and like I think I'm on a championship team here, like wide receivers are probably you know loaded like that's the you know that's your ticket um so i like i really love sanai as a prospect um you can get the landing spot with a rookie quarterback you know sky's the limit there um hoping jacob cohen falls cowing cohen not sure which one it is but you know that's where i'm looking for here i do love this third round in general though like you're talking about those wide receivers what rookie draft gives you this number of third round uh, rookie receivers that are going to step into that much opportunity. Right. And they're pushing all these guys out of lineups too. Like they're like these guys that were wide receiver threes are losing their jobs, you know, uh, right away. Like Zay Jones lost his job because these guys are coming in and, and, and filling those roles. And I just want to point out a couple guys we see in the sleeper app here. We've got, uh, who do we have here? We've Grindberg. got, Whoa. We've got Whoa. Grindberg. No, we got real you. quick, real quick. I uh, just accidentally made a mistake. I wasn't supposed to draft Luke McCaffrey there. Okay. <laughs> I think I have auto pick on. That's all right. We'll let it slide. It's fine. He was, uh, I didn't see Kamani Vidal went right before. I was freaking yeah. out a little bit. I'm good with the McCaffrey pick though. He's pretty close. It's a good pick. Was hoping like Vidal fell to me. I've actually got Vidal, uh, 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 it's actually by Dal. I keep pronouncing it incorrectly because it's more fun. Uh, ranked so as, a, as a second round talent, like late second round. And so I've been consistently getting him in the third round. So I absolutely love that pick. Once Marshawn Lloyd's off the board or Jalen Wright, you know, those top five running backs, I think it's, you know, uh, by Dal season or Vidal. Um, but yeah, I'm thrilled with McCaffrey there too. So no complaints. Yeah, agreed. That's a good one. We got to do right, time for your shout outs. Yeah. Okay. We got, we got Derek Fuchs from the droppables in here. Uh, we've got too much Brian and we've got Tyler from fantasy football advice network. There are, uh, you know, Ty Tyler's our guy there. So uh, thanks for joining in on our draft. Uh, we also have Bradley from fantasy football advice network. So thanks everybody for joining our draft and, uh, and coming in and hanging out with us tonight. Yeah. And shout out to Grinberg, Schultz and uh, Kuvt. You guys are All in right. the draft too. <laughs> we are so in yeah, the draft. I got, um, <clears throat> there you go, Schultz. You got cowing. You, you, you got your cowing. God damn it. Yeah, I, so we were talking a little bit pre-show, and I think this is when uh he hit the record button on us in the middle of the conversation. I mean, <laughs> compared to Pearsall, I could see him being more of an impactful player this year. Um, assuming Debo and Ayuk are still around, who knows? But if they're still there. Cowing kind of projects as a player who's going to stylistically fit better with those two, I think, than Pearsall. Uh, I think yes. he's going to I think he's going to be doing a lot of slot work. I think he gets really good separation uh, over the middle and underneath. Um, the problem is like when he does face contact or when he is pressured, you know, he has a hard time making contested catches. But fortunately, you know, he's got four three wheels. Uh, and he's very quick as well. So uh, I think he's going to be a yak guy, and Shanahan's going to be scheming him open once it's time for him to see the field. I'm not sure if it's in 24 or if it's in uh, 25. Um, I think the thing I like about Pearsall is he can fill in for both Ayuk and Debo if either Correct. of them go down in different mm-hmm. ways. He gets a lot of, you know, in college he got a lot of carries out of the backfield. So, you know, there's that Debo element to his game. Uh, but he's also uh, 
a real, real good route runner similar to Ayuk. So I think they can use him in more ways. Uh, and I think he's like the direct backup for both of them, whereas Cowing is filling sort of a different role. Right. He Pierce all had he he had a an almost even mix of lining up outside and in the slot, and Cowing was most mostly a slot receiver. So I got some interesting things here. Like I just see I'm not used to seeing so many uh running backs slide to the third round. You got Jalen Wright, Marshawn Lloyd. You know, Vidal, I'm seeing them going in, you know, late third, second round in a lot of my drafts. And just the way this this draft has fallen, uh, a lot of these wide receivers are kind of getting plucked up there. What, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Like what with this wide, with this running back slide, you got Jalen Wright, who I think is in a really good spot. And also Marshawn Lloyd uh, long term. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on those guys? Yeah, I have not seen them in any real draft fall out of the second round. Uh, yeah. And I think that that is correct. I think that they should be going in the second round and they are sure bets to, you know, deliver some value in 24 and beyond. Uh, whereas, you know, really once you get into the second and third round and fourth round wide receivers, those are shakier bets. All running back needs this opportunity. All these guys have the juice, right? They all have great speed scores. Um, and so when they get their opportunity, I think they're going to produce, whereas these wide receivers, they're going to have to consistently win and consistently earn targets. Um, so for me, the way my rankings are set up, all those running backs are in the second round, including Kamani Vidal, as we you yeah. know, already, already covered. So yeah, it'd be rare to actually see a board fall this way IRL, but, uh, you know, good for anybody who can grab these guys in the third round and beyond. Exactly. Like I just, I'm baffled by that. Like seeing Jalen Wright go where he is. I just think that, you know, Raheem Mostert being as aging as he is and how, you know, injury stricken Devon A. Chan has been throughout his rookie season. I just think there's an opportunity that Jalen Wright could easily go in there and get an opportunity right away and, uh, and steal a job and then just be the force for years to come. So he's a guy I'm going to have my eye on. If he flips to the third round, geez, Louise, that is something that I'd be all over for sure. Yeah. So right here, I'm shocked that Audric Estime has fallen this far mm -hmm. into the fourth round. I've got him as a third round running back. Now, you know, the, his situation is terrible and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I thought I was going to be landing Malik Washington here, who I also like quite a bit, but you know, uh, like I just said, eventually Audrey Estime's number is going to be called. And I think once Javante's out of Denver, which, you know, I still have hopes that's this off season somehow. Uh, but even if it's not, no, I think, I think next year we're going to see mm -hmm. Estime on the field and, uh, I think he's going to produce. So I'm keep, keep Javante that. there as long as possible. Um, <laughs> I, I would have taken Os Estime with the 4-1, except that I wanted to talk about Will Shipley. Yeah, and I've got Will Shipley one spot ahead of Estime, so uh, no arguments there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, Will Shipley is another guy we got to talk about a little bit here because of how much he was getting steamed up before the draft. Kind of a guy that's been like a, you know, pegged as a three down back, a guy that can go in and actually become a workhorse and then getting that Philly draw just as disappointing for a lot of people. Um, I like his overall long-term, you know, outlook because I think that Barkley is not going to be there long-term and uh, Will Shipley has proven to be able to take on a three down work ro horse role. And uh, just his receiving upside is just uh, on the next level. He's probably the best pass catching running back out of this whole class. Mm -hmm. So with that all being said, he's not in a great situation. So where, where do we see Shipley? And uh, obviously a fourth round is not where I was seeing him getting drafted before the draft. Like he was going second round in a lot of places where I was seeing him to, to drop two rounds. Is that, uh, is that justified or is that something that, uh, you know, you, you're going to take advantage of in drafts if he's going to go in the fourth round? Yeah. I mean, I have him firmly in the mid to late third round. Um, so it's not shocking to see him fall to the fourth round. I mean, it's, um, you know, kind of a bummer that he landed behind Saquon and, you know, part of the appeal with Will Shipley is also his passing game, you know, uh, acumen, right. But now he's paired with Jalen hurts for, you know, his rookie contract who doesn't throw to running backs all that much. So 
we're losing some of the upside on the pass catching, but I still think that he's going to be good between the tackles as a ball carrier. So he's another guy we just need to see the field, but I can see why he would fall because some of that perceived upside uh, has been nullified due to landing spot. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into the breakdown uh, before we get into our fallers, because we've got a couple fallers that we're going to have, you know, after the draft, we each pegged a rookie that uh, kind of fell down the board for us. And uh, let's just talk about the draft. And uh, maybe we'll start with you, Schultz, and kind of go over your four guys. And we, we, we talked a little about your, you know, your one, two and three, but talk a little bit more about Malik Washington and your number four spot and uh, how you see the upside there in Miami and uh, where, where you see his position in, in 2024. Well, I got to say, I was really pulling for Garendo there, but, you know, it's all good. Um, <clears throat> Washington, I mean, I love, obviously, the landing spot. You get thrown into that offense. Like, how do you not like that? Um, you're also now behind two receivers who have equally missed their, you know, some time. And you've got some real talent into that wider th- wide receiver three spot in Miami for the first time since McDaniel's been there. They've been trying to trot out. Braxton Berrios and a uh, Rivers Craycraft, something you know, like <laughs> I was gonna say, is that a Braxton Berrios slam? Come on, it, uh, yeah, you know, he can slam me. I mean, I've seen those muscles, but I'm I'm not trying to start a fight here. But hey, <laughs> I think we've got some juice here at the you know the wide receiver three spot in Miami for the first time. So yeah, I'm gonna in late fourth round. I think that's an easy stab with some upside. Yeah, I think he's just to give you some Malachi context. Corley. Yes, agreed. Just to give Joe. you give you some context, uh, in a startup I just did, I drafted. Uh, where'd it go? Ah, I drafted Braxton Berrios with the two one. So love it. It's it's a kickoff returner league. So um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I love me some bb as far as malik oh. goes i was really really excited about him landing in miami thinking he's going to step right into that number three role but then when they signed odell beckham that kind of cast yeah. a little bit of a shadow but you know it's similar to what we were just talking about with pearsall on the niners where i think odell beckham can be the direct backup to both tyree kill and jalen waddle uh and that malik is still better suited as the slot guy and the guy you know the yak guy for that underneath stuff that mm, i'm sure uh mcdaniels is going to scheme up for him so uh it might just be a buying opportunity the the doubt that the odell beckham signing has cast on him uh and yeah he, he's a really fun player and that puts into context as as a, a former tyreek hill owner um, I have zero shares now and zero cares. There's one thing that we know about uber fast players. They are prone to ticky tack injuries that are frustrating for fantasy owners. And so as a backup, Odell's going to be s- s- coming in for Tyreek Hill next time he has a little tear or a sprained ankle or something like that. Something that pulls him out of a game. It's not necessarily going to affect Tyreek Hill over the course of the season. Uh, but yeah, he Odell's going to be in position to be taking over, and they're still going to have an, an ability to to put Malik Washington on the field and get the ball in his hands. I think yeah, Odell I is a way better uh, real life football signing than it is a fantasy signing. Like like what you just mentioned, like he is going to have such a huge impact on you know on a game day. But for fantasy, yeah, I'm not a huge fan, and yeah, give me Washington. Totally. Cream Cream will rise. Okay, Joe, your your go. Yeah, yeah, I I love the I love the Brock Bowers pick. I seem is he seems to be sliding a little bit into that spot where uh, where pre draft he was going at the one hundred seven one hundred six. Now he's sliding into the one hundred eight one hundred nine spot. I've seen Xavier Worthy go ahead of Brock Bowers, which I think is just ludicrous in my Blasphemy. opinion. Blasphemy. I I I do think that uh, you know Brock Bowers is the end of that first. Like the, the end of that, you know, tier with Roma Dunze and JJ McCarthy and Drake May, all those guys kind of fit into that tier. And I think uh, I think that Brock Bauer is at the end and then Lad McConkey starts the next tier, in my opinion. Uh, what are your thoughts on that getting Brock Bowers at the eighth spot? I think that's a really good spot to get him. 
Well, yeah, I got him at the nine spot. And like I said, I, nine did, not spot. Yeah, sorry. I, I did not expect him to be there. I chose 109 intentionally because I thought it was going to be a harder decision. This was a real quick button push for me. Um, mm -hmm. So I understand, I think, where the market is coming from a little bit. You know, Devontae Adams is there and he you know, got 170 plus targets last year and he's probably going to get that again. Uh, Jacoby Myers there. And then they've also got, you know, Michael Mayer, who was also no slouch in college up until, you know, the existence of a Brock Bowers. Uh, he was the greatest tight end in uh, college football history. So the presence of another tight end, the presence of another dominant alpha wide receiver uh, and probably questions about the quarterback play in uh, Las Vegas is what is pushing him down a little bit. But I think that's galaxy braining it. I mean, this is a generational talent at a position where all we care about is the super high producers, the people that have the most upside. And there's no denying it from his athletic ability, which is evident on tape and his production profile that he is one of those guys and one of the best prospects we've ever seen. I, I tend to think they're going to figure out a way to get him volume, if not, you know, a ton in his rookie year, certainly as his career goes on. So I have no hesitation whatsoever, but I think that's what the market thinks. And if you want more Raiders talk, <laughs> tune in on Thursday nights at 8 p.m. to the Undroppables channel on YouTube, where I host the Uncovered, the Raiders Unrivaled show. We go live. Uh, we're actually moving to Tuesdays in a couple weeks. And you can hear me and other hosts talk more about people like Brock Bowers, who ate my pizza. Sorry. <laughs> Undroppables on YouTube. <laughs> Okay, Fantastic and then one player. more pick here. I I, I want to hear a little bit more about it is uh, I know you were auto picked for Luke McCaffrey, Joe, but in that range, around the board there, would would he be a guy you'd be picking in that range, or or who would have been the guy that you would have been going going for uh, around that spot there? Yeah, so actually, I freaked out for no reason because I had set him up in my queue right after Kamani Vidal, and I didn't realize that uh, Vidal got drafted, and I accidentally had auto pick on because I let the clock run out on Roman Wilson. So he was next in my queue. That is who I would have picked, uh, to be clear. Um, the thing about McCaffrey that's so interesting to me is what do we always talk about with wide receivers? It's their breakout age. How early were they a producer? And what gets lost with McCaffrey um, to, you know, the novice or someone who's not looking that closely is that he didn't start playing wide receiver until his junior year, where he immediately started producing. And by his second year as a wide receiver, uh, you know, he was crushing it. So you kind of need to look at him in sort of a different light, like he was a producer as a freshman and then a mega producer as a sophomore. Um, because those are the two first years that he started playing wide receiver. So he has this actually early production profile, uh, incomplete production profile, because he converted from quarterback to wide receiver. So not only that, but his athletic profile looked very good at the combine. He's fast. He's you know got everything else we're looking for. I think mm -hmm. he's going to be a great slot player. Uh, and I think he's really undervalued right now. So I'm real comfortable with him in the third round. I think he's a value, and I think he's – probably going to end up out producing where he was drafted in the NFL draft and in, you know, our rookie drafts um, that's yet to be seen. And obviously there's still some development left to go for someone who converted uh, to wide receiver so late in their college career, but um, the upside seems higher than just about anybody else on the board right there. Yeah. Yeah. I concur with that one for sure. Now, Biggs, I'm looking at your hey. draft and, and hey. I'm just, I'm I'm looking at it. And I'm like, what the hell are you thinking? Caleb Williams, 101. Tell me about that pick. Um, I, I picked the 101 specifically because that's the only time I'm ever going to draft Caleb Williams because he's constantly going at the 101. And uh, I can only get him in mock drafts because I never have the 101. And uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's this was my only <laughs> only chance when I get to choose the draft position uh, it's my only chance to draft Caleb so that that's what I did I already explained my my uh, Will Shipley pick Malachi Corley I I love the fact that he is vibing with Aaron Rodgers already and even though Garrett Wilson is going to be the 
the man in New York. Uh, I, I really love Malachi Corley's profile. Blake Corum, I think he's got a really quick path to starting. I think he can probably take over by the end of the summer. And uh, if all things dra- drop um, the way that they they should, uh, given his draft capital versus Kyron Williams. I do want to get hand out the two uh, draft MVPs. Obviously, none of us are eligible. Uh, and, you know, we would all share the title because of our four perfect drafts. Uh, but the first one is going to go to Love Tractor 3, uh, not just because of his name. I love the J.J. McCarthy pick. I love I love the, the dichotomy of J.J. McCarthy from his like low volume Michigan roots going to Minnesota where he's got all of these wide receiver options, Aaron Jones, who's a, a receiving running back uh, in his best days. And just the idea of the Vikings slowing the game down with a heavy running attack is not in the cards. And they were willing to, to spend the capital to grab JJ McCarthy because the Vikings have confidence that he can be a high production quarterback in the NFL. And so do I. Um, Troy Franklin, I love that pick. He's going to vibe with Bo Nix. Uh, they're going to uh, spearhead the the second coming of the Broncos Walmart era, which they're never going to win anything, especially in Las Vegas. I like Jatavion Sanders. I think he's going to do well to kind of help out Bryce Young. And of course, Dylan Lobb, Lobby, uh, the jury's still out on his pronunciation. I I think he has a chance, given his special teams ability, to get himself on the field as the Raiders' third round back before the end of the season. I love that as a fourth round pick. That's brilliant. And then the other one uh, I was looking at was FFDF with Jonathan Brooks. Obviously, he can take over from Chuba before the summer's over. I have a hard time with Jalen, Jalen Polk and Jalen McMillan with the way that they're falling, I would flip them in terms of what I think long term their their profiles are going to uh, portend as their their careers go on in the NFL. I think Jalen McMillan is a better wide receiver than Jalen Polk, but for now Jalen Polk has a better opportunity. Um, and then I love Isaac Garendo in the fourth round. I think he is going to be Kyle Shanahan's heir apparent to Christian McCaffrey. And I think long term that, especially from the 11 slot, that is a fantastic draft. Um, so those are my two MVPs of the draft: FFDF and Tractor. What what was it? Love Tractor, <laughs> Love Tractor. <laughs> uh, shout, shout out to Derek Fuchs. That's FFDF, yeah. our buddy from the Undroppables. Derek, yeah. you did it, and Love Tractor Three. You win the draft just for the name. It's Love a great it. name. <laughs> All right, so. Now that we've recapped the draft, let's get into some fallers. We've each got a faller. You get into some fallers. Uh, yeah. Well, how about we go with our guest? Okay. Dyn- Dynasty Joe, you've probably identified a faller in the range of these rookies. And uh, who's a guy that you're kind of just like, ah, oh, I don't like very much after their landing spot? Are we talking about as it pertains to this uh, mock draft we just did no or? just kind of like in general who oh, is sure. kind of like who is your least favorite landing spot player and how oh, does man. it affect your team i've got lists from multiple positions so you tell me where you want to start i would say well well we've got uh, uh biggs and i have got our own wide receiver so if you go anywhere else that would be cool so we don't uh, overlap here all right well i'll start at running back then um Will Shipley, we already talked about during the mock draft. Yeah. I'm very bummed because, uh, you know, I was on record before the NFL draft saying he was going to be my most owned uh, running back. Um, and that was after his pro day where he, you know, ran a 4-3-9. Now, granted, you know, you got to take pro days with the grain of salt. Uh, but that would have put his speed score over 110. And even if you yep. adjust it uh, by 0.05, like, you know, you see a lot of reputable websites like player profiler do uh he still would have been like at a 105 speed score really good burst score um and so i was thrilled about him then he got stuck behind saquon who they just gave a big contract to and like i said um having a quarterback that doesn't throw the ball to running backs all that often really takes away a lot of the upside in a profile like will shipley's 
That being said, Eagles got themselves a heck of a running back, and I think when he gets his opportunity, he's going to find a way to shine. Uh, the other running back we already also talked about was Audric Estime. Uh, was very bummed about his landing spot as well. This is another guy who shot up my rankings after his pro day because he had a subpar 40 time at the combine. He came in at a 471. Then in his pro day, pro day he ran like a 459, if I'm not mistaken which made all the difference in the world because he went from a sub 90 speed score, which is a huge red flag uh, to uh, about a 95 speed score, uh, which is totally fine. Uh, but now he's probably in the most crowded backfield in the NFL, right? They've got, um, you know, they've got Javante Williams. Uh, they've got Jaleel McLaughlin. They've got uh, P Ryan. And in addition to that, they also, these darn Broncos, uh, went and picked up my favorite undrafted rookie free agent in Blake Watson, who was my yep. sleeper running back. So now they've got, you know, five running backs, three of which that I like, and, you know, none of whom can actually give us the numbers we want to see in fantasy. So I'm really bummed, which is, uh, as I was saying, why I want to see Javante moved uh, just so that Estime and hopefully Blake Watson uh, can get a little bit of run in Denver. I doubt that P Ryan makes it through camp on this team. Uh, and I think Javante has got some trade value. So we'll see if like the Cowboys or anybody else is willing to step up and make a deal for him. I bet you he could be had for a song. Um, if we're sticking with running backs, the other two obvious ones, I think are uh, Braylon Allen and Isaiah Davis. They both got the same landing spot, which is mm -hmm. directly behind the arguably best mm, top three running back in the NFL in Brees Hall who is going to get a lot of volume uh, and they are basically just um, uh, break, break glass in case of injury and emergency uh, to Brees Hall. Now, you know, what's interesting about Braylon Allen is they, they did, there was some talk from uh, Robert Sala last year that really annoyed me just talking about how Brees Hall needed to be more aggressive on his runs up the middle, which was just absurd because everyone's thinking, why are you, you know, taking your Ferrari off-roading? Uh, why are you, why are you running him up the middle? <laughs> Get this guy in space. So there actually may be a role there for Braylon Allen to, you know, be the meat shield for Brees Hall, which I'm totally fine with because that's exactly what he should be is a two down grinder. And if that keeps Brees healthy and, um, uh, you know, gives him those higher value touches and a little bit less of the, uh, you know, meat and potato stuff at running back. Uh, I'm good with that. But there's no way both of these guys can succeed without, you know, multiple injuries in that backfield. Not to mention they blew up one of my favorite uh, backups in Izzy Abandikanda. So, <laughs> so all those running backs uh, I'm very sad for. And I think we're going to have to wait until 2025 or, you know, the misfortune of some other players before we actually see them, you know, uh, fully shine. That was a really, really great yeah. uh, breakdown on the running backs. Uh, I really appreciate that. Our viewers definitely appreciate that because there's a lot of question marks there. And I think you hit the nail on the head and breaking all those guys down. So great job, Joe. Appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you. I spend way too much time excellent. on this. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's, uh, it's important. It's a. Uh, that it, it, it's exactly what we needed to hear. So Biggs, why don't you run us down your faller there? Um, let, let's go with Schultzy first. <clears throat> Schultz, do you have any fallers that you saw? Am um, I allowed to say Michael Penix? Or is that just the low-hanging fruit? <laughs> no, no, he's no. on my <laughs> list too. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it just sucks all around there. Um, I'm not touching him with a 10-foot bull in Dynasty. You're looking at two years to play. And then you typically need two years to evaluate a quarterback. So you're talking for his the entirety of his rookie deal, essentially, um, you know, granted the fifth year option, but just to find out whether you got a dude. Um, and I can't I just can't get there with that. And so, like I said, even if he you know, you're waiting all this time and if he sucks, you're out four years rather than, you know, these other rookies you're drafting like bone, you know, Bo Nix is in the same kind of draft area somehow. I don't, you know, I, it blows me away. But with Nix, you're going to know, you know, sooner than later whether you got to move on, draft a new guy. But Penix, you're just, you're just stuck. 
I got yeah, it, uh, a lot so of it has to do with how how long how long in your league what your league setters are settings are for your taxi squad. If you have a two year taxi squad, draft Michael Penix, put him in your taxi squad, and and just wait. Um, but if it's any any longer than that, um, he's he's kind of kind of screwed. Yeah, Sorry, Joe. Gonna, go ahead. No, I was actually going to say the same thing. So it depends on what platform you're on and what the rules are, right? So like in FFPC leagues, right? Michael Penix is undraftable. Um, it's just difficult because those are shorter mm-hmm. benches. I think during the season you can hold 20. I should know this off the top of my head, but it's the off season. But I think you can hold 20 men on your roster. And so you just can't burn a roster spot like that on a guy like Michael Penix. Um Versus, you know, if you were on sleeper and there's a taxi squad and you've got 28, 30 man rosters, then I have no problem burning, you know, a back end roster spot and bench spot on Michael Penix and just waiting for a guy who got top 10 draft capital. I mean, this is what we want at the quarterback position. So you got to take the swing if you can afford the opportunity cost of holding and sitting on him for a couple of years. So to me, it's league format and league rules and, you know, most importantly, bench <clears throat> bench spot allocation dependent. Yeah, I think there's a very yeah. small uh, portion of teams who are in the position to to taxi squat a second rounder, though, like for, you know, to, for that long. Um, but I think if I had another one. And I'm a Jags fan. I'm I'm going Michael Tom- or I'm not Michael Thomas. Brian Thomas. Sorry. Um, obviously the the offense was clicking last year before Trevor's injuries piled up. Trevor was playing lights out. Um, and I expect the same player, if not more, this year. Which you would think, hey, first round receiver plus this young good quarterback, like I'm all in, but. One, there's mouths to feed there. They're, you're looking at uh, Thomas. Uh, now they got Gabe Davis, Christian Kirk, Evan Ingram. The There's just so much competition. I don't see Brian Thomas outputting the, the fantasy results that people want from that draft capital. A lot of times it's late first right now. Um, and then on top of that, to me, he profiles way too similarly to Gabe Davis. Um, the burner, deep threat, um, you know, you can get him on those quick slants and get him running and stuff like that. Um, you know, pretty pretty deep average depth of target guy. So I was a little confused there. I think they're banking on this guy developing like a route tree and, you know, really profiling as that true X guy. I don't see it. Um I love the speed. I love the intangibles. But like I said, he, to me, he profiles like Gabe Davis. He's in an offense with a ton of miles to feed. And I just don't see the like X receiver ability like a Calvin Ridley was in that offense. Where they, and I think that's what they're hoping he develops to. Yeah, I have a similar take on Brian Thomas, although I think they were misusing Calvin Ridley just solely on the perimeter and near the boundaries, Um, you know, and they had him running this very limited route tree, right? Yes. It kind of works for Brian Thomas because he does have a very limited route tree, right? He had, you know, I think it was some insane number of his routes were nine routes and, you know, he runs curls and, you know, slants basically, or and outs, excuse me. So, you know, but basically three routes made up 70% of his uh, actual targets while he was in college. So for the Jags, I think it's a good fit. But for him, I do think that his upside is really capped in that role. You mentioned the same role competition with Gabe Davis, but also um, uh, the target competition with Ingram and Kirk underneath. And I'm afraid that what both of their both of them are going to be doing is clearing out space for uh, Lawrence to work underneath with Kirk and Ingram. Now I will, Lawrence has a beautiful deep ball. He's never had a player in the NFL to go with that. Um, His rookie year, he was throwing deep balls to Laquan Treadwell. Um, So I think, you know, Davis is going to have, or I'm sorry, Thomas is going to have that, you know, ability for him and it's going to be huge. But yeah, I, I, we never really saw Thomas get pressed in college that much. And a lot of times his comebacks, his slants, his curls were on 10 yards of soft coverage. So in my opinion, that reception perception tree is a little, a little skewed. 
Sure. Yeah. And I actually noticed the same thing. I sampled like six games for Brian Thomas. And one of my notes was that it looked like he did okay against press, but it was very rare that he was ever actually pressed. They were playing so far off of him that off you know, of him. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he could usually just find a little pocket uh, yep. if he wasn't going deep, uh, but he did win deep a lot. So and in you know, college, you have to respect that speed. Sure. But it's, that's not going to be the same in, in the NFL. So that's my biggest question mark with him. Yeah. I think it's going to be just, low percentage, he's... low percentage opportunities. Yeah, and, and he's going to be the number one target. Well, like hypothetically, it in Jacksonville, and uh, you know, uh, Malik Neighbors is the number one target earner in LSU. So, like he's he he was getting a lot of the double coverages, and when Brian Thomas now is going to be the guy that people are going to be targeting, how is he going to how is he going to respond to that? You know, getting that extra guy and at an NFL level too. Um, I'm just not sold on Brian Thomas based off of some of the some of the metrics that, that I you know grade things on and uh, yeah I, I, I'm right there with you guys on him and uh, some people think that that's a really good landing spot for Brian Thomas. It's not the most ideal for me. Yeah, he he's way down my board and uh, just looking at the unscore real quick. His model comps: Charlie Jones, Quentin Johnston, Woo! Sky Moore, Jalen Polk. Xavier Hutchinson, Cortland Sutton, Danny Gray, John Mechie. So Cortland Sutton is his, his uh, ceiling. And who of those other guys are you going to draft where you're drafting Brian Thomas Jr.? No yeah. way. Yeah, you get on Jag's Twitter and everybody's pumped. And then there's me who's just – I was drafting <laughs> on it draft night. Wet, and everyone wet blanket Schultz. Man, I, I'm just not there with it. I – I went into it with round one as a Jags fan. Like, I don't want Brian Thomas. <laughs> yeah. Now, the helmet I, scout in me is saying, well, you used to have Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase in the same same wide receiver room. Now you've got – so, yeah. I will say, just quick clarification, Big. So, as far as the UN score is concerned, you know, that is for players who scored similarly. I wouldn't Correct. say that any of those guys are really like a player comp for Brian Thomas. I think his no, no, upside, no. I think his upside is like a DK Metcalf, who also, yes. you know, scored similarly in the UN right. score, right? So, I, I wasn't trying to imply. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't trying a, to imply that they were similar receivers. I just wanted it to was, clear it up for the listeners yeah, that yeah. you know it's not a player comp; it is a score comp. Right. Uh, that's an important distinction, but uh, yeah, and I, like DK actually scored lower than Brian Thomas did in the UN score, so I think that that is sort of like the high end profile of what he can become, and that's another guy who's made it work in the NFL as an alpha wide receiver on you know really three mm -hmm. routes certainly to start his career. He's developed a little bit more since then. And so I think we're going to see something similar from Brian Thomas, but hopefully it's the same production. Oh, I think Ho the hopefully for Jags is, fans. Yeah. I think yeah. the DK model is, is the, the reason that uh, reason. saw a path for him. Yeah. Agreed. So uh, Biggs, do you want to hit up yours or, or are you ready? For yeah. My, or do you want my big follower is a situational guy. Um, you know, we, we have a mantra in Dynasty, and it's talent over situation. And sometimes uh, you just kind of have to make a decision based on the situation, which is why I've been drafting a lot of Lad McConkie over my father, Romo Doomsday. Uh, Romo Doomsday, I just don't like the fact that he's in such uh, – you talk about a lot of mou mouths to feed. You've got DJ Moore, who's an established wide receiver one. You got Keenan Allen, who's an established wide receiver one, working out of the slot. They're going to be lining up Odunze uh, in the the Z spot, but then you have Cole Komet. You have Gerald Everett, who's going to be spelling Cole Komet. You've got Roshan Johnson, Khalil Herbert, and DeAndre Swift, who are all pass catching running backs or capable of of being pass catching running backs. And then you have them with a rookie quarterback who as much steam as Caleb Williams has, and the fact that he's 101 in the NFL draft and in, in fantasy rookie drafts, etc., um, he's still a rookie quarterback. And an offensive line that not only wasn't great in front of Justin Fields, but <clears throat> also lost Cody Whitehair, who, <laughs> if he was still there, would improve the Bears line a little bit. Not that he's good. He's going to be a backup on the Raiders, but he's not there anymore either. So um, they 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 drafted a punter. 
I don't. I love the offensive weapons in Chicago. I just don't have a whole lot of faith that it's going to be as productive in year one as we think. I think there's a, a much better structure and uh, and success path for Lad McConkey uh, and him developing a relationship that's very special and unique with Justin Herbert versus Odunze in you know a, a pond with so many fishes. Uh, I'm I'm glad you brought this up because you mentioned taking Lad over a Dunze on Twitter, and I commented yeah. and said, "Remind me to yell at you." So here I am. <laughs> here we go. James, what are you doing, dude? What are you doing? This is. I love crazy. Lad McConkey. I love Lad too. I yeah. love Lad. I call it Nightcrawler. I think he's a really unique player, and I think he's got uh, as golden of opportunity as there is in this draft class. But from a profile standpoint. You know, we can't just look at year one and be worried about target share. We got to be drafting the alphas. And as much as I love Lad, he is a slot flanker, right? That's that's his yes. upside. He is never going to be a dominant X. And Adunze can play everywhere, and he can be a dominant X playing with what we think is a phenom at quarterback. So, you know, Keenan Allen's already 33 years old, like, I, you, you just can't let California the, Golden Bears legend Keenan Allen. Yes, uh, I love me some Keenan Allen, um, but uh, I just can't uh, I can't co-sign on that one. You got to take a Dunze over a lad. The, the only there. counter I have for that is the fact that he's such a zone beater and he's going to demand targets. He's going to be open all the time for Justin Herbert. I and think that's, so too. The, the way that Keenan Allen worked out of the slot a lot um, I, I think there's there's a good analogy there. Um, and Keenan Allen was open a lot. I, I can picture a universe in which Lad McConkey is getting over 100, 120 targets a season. And the way that he yaks and what he does with the ball in his hands, he's going to, he can, he is the kind of wide receiver that can survive with a low A dot because he's going to be earning the production that he gets. And, and I just, I love that profile, especially in the Chargers offense. They're, they're, uh, Jim Harbaugh wants to play close to the line of scrimmage. And I think Lad McConkey is the perfect wide receiver in, in that offense, especially with Justin Herbert and, him, him getting the ball to him. I, I love it. Yeah. And I don't actually have any concerns about his a dot. I think that he's, you know, a, a, Jim Harbaugh just had another great slot receiver in Michigan in Roman Wilson, whose a dot was very healthy. It was North of 10 yards. Uh, it was between 10 and 14 yards, just like lad. So they're actually both in very healthy a dot territory. I don't think it's going to be like a really close to the line of scrimmage type of thing. And I do agree with you. He's going to get a lot of yak. Uh, I just think that, you know, uh, Aroma Dunze is a guy that's mm, an alpha profile in any other year. He'd be the wide receiver one off. Sure. The board. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, sure. The target competition is a real thing. And if you're playing just for 2024, uh, I agree with you. I think probably lad probably will have a better rookie season than Rome. Uh, I just think from a career trajectory wise, um, I don't know. I, I I'm excited about Rome and uh, I, I love them both. We, and, that, <laughs> and that's that's a theme that has come up on this show uh, over, you know, uh, this show, other shows, um, other dynasty stuff that Mike and I do. Um, yeah. There's nothing wrong with a strategy where you are looking to win now and not like you're not kicking the can down the down the road. You're like you're concentrating on right now. So if it's a startup uh, drafting old guys in a dynasty startup kind of mm -hmm. it's kind of a similar bend um and i don't want to wait fair not not when i have lad mcconkey at home <laughs> i think the biggest thing for ron right. is allen's only under contract through this year um and i believe they have a potential out on dj Moore if they choose after the season as well and even then he would only be under contract one more year after so yeah i mean it the room does clear up for the future but for this year, I do 100% agree it's Lad. Yeah. Like next year, I think Rome is going to be the guy. And, uh, you know, him paired with Caleb Williams is going to be something special for years to come. But 2024, uh, I'm definitely, uh, like everybody says, uh, I'm a big Lad McConkey, you know, investor. And uh, I think he's going to have a great 2024 and beyond. So 
I'm going to wrap the show up with my last follower, and that is uh, a guy that uh, I wasn't very high on going into the the draft, and uh, I'm definitely not as high on him now, and that is uh, Colts wide receiver Adonai Mitchell. Uh, drafting Adonai Mitchell, you know, with the 20th pick in the second round was not great news when you consider, you know, Everybody was pegging him. A lot of people were pegging him as a first round draft capital. He had 55 catches for 845 yards and 11 touchdowns in 14 games for the Longhorns. He did play beside Xavier Worthy and was drafted almost a full round later. So when you think about that, he wasn't commanding a whole lot of targets in that offense. And, you know, there was some issues about him taking the odd play off more than the odd play in my opinion and when you look at his tape he was taking a lot of plays off and uh that just doesn't translate well when you think about the situation he was put in in the Indianapolis Colts uh you know they got a very good uh possession uh receiver in Michael Pittman and then a great uh slot guy in Josh Downs and I just don't see there being a huge target share for a guy like Adonai Mitchell who yes he's a deep threat and a guy that you know, Anthony Richardson is going to target, but you're going to have to peg those big play games. And I'm just not convinced I'm going to be able to do that uh, with this team. And, uh, you know, they're a run heavy team with, uh, you know, Anthony Richardson and and Jonathan Taylor. So those are the guys that are going to get the, 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 the steam early. And I just don't like the landing spot. I don't like the draft capital. And I just don't think that Anthony Richardson is going to be airing it out a whole lot in his first year uh, with Adonai Mitchell. I just think that that offense is going to take the slow route and, uh, and, and try and win some games here early. And I just don't think they're going to need to air the ball out as much as uh, some people think. And, uh, some people love that uh, that landing spot. Me, on the other hand, I'm definitely not a, a guy that's in on Adonai Mitchell this year. He's yeah. also got to jump Alec Pierce on the depth chart. And uh, the only way he's going to do that is either to outburn him on, on go routes or play special teams. And I don't think he's built for special teams. Yeah, I think he's a better real life addition. I think he's going to serve a very important purpose for, sure. for that offense. But I mean, if you go back and look at it, the entirety of his college career, his time at Georgia and Texas, over his career, his yards per route run, 1.68 anything nope. below two yards per route run uh is a big red flag i mean yeah. already once you're below two yards per route run i mean you are less than a 40 percent chance of being a hit at the nfl level his yards per team pass attempt at 1.02 over the course of his career so even on like uh and these are for you know uh for the uh all the team pass attempts not just uh route run numbers it's it's a shockingly low number uh his first downs per route run 8.97 uh that's probably a little bit of a red flag uh usually below eight's a red flag so that's not as concerning of a number but this is the other one the uh targets per route run he's under 20 percent at uh 19 percent you know 20 Win sprints is, 20 is the yeah. threshold that we want to see so i think we're going to see a lot of the same in the NFL as we did in college. Now in college, he did put some great stuff on tape, right? He was very good at stacking defenders. He did have great body control. And sometimes he would run these very nasty routes. Um, but with the presence of Michael Pittman and uh, Downs, uh, I think those two are going to be absorbing most of the limited targets we're going to see mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. So I'm and, and Jelani Woods. Yeah, Angelani Woods. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I have one more wide receiver. I know you said we were going out on that one, but I, I, I got I got to no, take. Go I got to get off. All right, Keon Coleman. I'm terrified. Juicy. Me I am, too. I am terrified. The fit. Bonus on, take. Yeah, yeah, the fit on Buffalo is really, really strange. They've already come out and said they said in the first presser that he's going to be playing X for them. Which is concerning because he profiles a as a he's, he's he profiles he's a as a big slot. slot. Yeah. yeah, I was saying that before the draft. Matt Harmon was saying that before the draft. You know, not to compare myself to him, he's the receiver expert. But it, it was just really obvious to anybody who had ever watched him play. Struggle with separation, particularly against man. You put him alone on an island against NFL corners. They pressing him. I don't think he's going to be getting the separation needed. You know, he was very good at contested catch situations, but that was out of necessity because he can't get separation. So 
He was good at beating zone, which is why he profiles as a big slot. The problem is they've got Dalton Kincaid. He's, you know, effectively a big slot. They picked up Curtis Samuel, who uh, plays a lot of slot. They've got Khalil Shakir, who profiles as a slot player. So I think what's ultimately going to end up happening here is Curtis Samuel is going to have to become their outside guy and their deep threat. And I'm really worried that they've got all this redundant uh, players who get open in a redundant place for them on the field. I'm actually worried for Buffalo at large with this selection and their offense Mm. because I think it's going to be clunky. It reminds me kind of of like what Carolina was doing in the Cam Newton days uh, where they just got these big guys and just asking, you know, Cam to throw it there. So I don't know. It's a big red flag for me. I could be wrong. He could do great. Maybe Josh Allen is that good, Mm. but I am terrified. Um, You know, his draft capital forced me to rank them, rank him sort of the way that I did. But uh, I think mm, it's going to be ugly and there's going to be some growing pains in Buffalo unless he um, unless Josh Allen is that good. And Keon Coleman shows us something we haven't seen yet to me. I think they needed to put Josh Allen around some people that actually separate from the ball, not guys that are all the same, you know, you know, archetyped, you know, they need guys that like, can you imagine like the draft capital was there. They could have slid back and drafted a guy like Lad McConkey who can freaking separate or Xavier worthy who they let slide to the chiefs. And I get why they did it, but these are guys that Josh Allen needs. He doesn't need a guy that could just go up and catch the ball. He doesn't need that. Now he needs guys that can, you know, create space in those, you know, short intermediate routes. And I think you hit the head on the nail there. Keon Coleman is a big red flag for me. I I was really, they, they had him pegged as a guy that they wanted pre-draft and, and I get why, but when you're going to play him outside of where he thrives in the slot, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of the rationale was like Josh Allen wanted him. It's like, okay, that's, that's great. And you want to make your quarterback <laughs> happy and everything, but uh did, did any of the scouts kind of think through how this was going to work for their offense? And listen, I am no scout. I could be wrong. Coleman may be capable of way more than I believe possible, but I am uh, uh, proceeding with a lot of caution. Well, hey, here, Aaron Rodgers let's, wanted Randall Cobb too, so. <laughs> exactly. Here, here's something that we'll leave you with so that you can think on. What if Keon Coleman was just bad because of Jordan Travis. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, my concern is he was worse than Johnny Wilson, who went in the sixth round. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. But he awesome. was also better than Jade and Reed in their time together at Michigan State. So I don't know. That's why there's just it, it, he's such a confusing prospect. I really wish he landed somewhere else, though, where he could play a more natural role because I think they're trying to square peg round hole this thing. Yeah. That sounds a lot like Quentin Johnston and Traylon Burks mm-hmm. and a lot of other guys that we've seen go that way and uh, just broke our hearts. Who <laughs> pick suey. Yeah. We get older, we get wiser. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that was a great show. Joe, we really appreciate you coming on and hanging out with us. Schultz, thanks for, you know, your first show, your inaugural show with us. And uh, we appreciate that. Biggs, bring us home, my buddy. All right. Uh, you can find me at Big Boned FFB on Twitter, Grindberg at FFCanuck99, Joe Kuvitakis, Dynasty underscore Joe FF, Zach Schultz at Schul- one C- S-C-H-U-1, Z-Z-Y. <laughs> He's our new producer. We've got a lot coming at you. Big announcements coming up um, probably next week. Uh, rhymes with Atreon. Um, and uh <clears throat> we will be doing mock drafts throughout the summer we hope that you uh can can uh, join us for those like subscribe share hit the bell comment uh give us some feedback and uh, as always we hope you win we hope you win peace Producer. out everybody thanks for thanks having me guys we hope you win yeah <laughs>